recording. Hey everyone, I'm Paul Vanuk, the technical editor for Recording Magazine, and in our July 2018 issue dedicated to guitars, I did an article titled Pedals in the Mix. I'm not a guitar player, but despite that, over the years my studio has built up a healthy collection of guitar effects pedals that I like to use in my mixes on synths, drums, vocals, and more, much in the same way that you would use traditional rack mount effects and plugins. That article in this video is not so much a how to use guitar pedals as studio effects, but rather how to integrate them into your studio setup so that they're available to use at any given time, in any order, and more importantly, as simply as you would hook up any outboard effect. In the past, when I wanted to use a pedal as an outboard effect, I had to grab the pedal, search through my power supply bin for the correct adapter, and then decide how I was going to convert the pedal impedance for use as a line level studio device, otherwise known as reamping. Then I had to figure out what device I was going to use to accomplish that task, patch it and the pedal in and out of my preamps and patch bay, and once satisfied, the pedal had to sit on my desk or on the floor and hopefully not get moved, kicked, or bumped for the life of the project. My solution was to take the pedal board concept and adapt it for studio use in the form of an always hooked up and ready to go set of pull out pedal shelves. Rather than hooking the pedals up in a predetermined series like a guitarist would on a traditional pedal board, I decided I wanted all of the pedals hooked up to a patch bay at all times so I could use one pedal or five in any order at any time. Step one was finding a rack shelf. While many of the well-known audio rack companies offer shelves in the $80 to $140 range, I went with sliding 19-inch server shelves made by Navepoint, a small company based in northern Illinois and very popular in the computer world. The Navepoint, which look very close to many of the music branded ones, can be had for around $40 each on Amazon. I chose to go with two shelves, each with a 14-inch by 17-inch surface. Note that the entire shelf will not pull out of the rack. For stability, three to four inches will always be recessed in your rack, even when the shelf is fully extended. With this in mind, my next step was to determine which pedals I wanted to rack up, and then arrange them like puzzle pieces on the shelves, along with cabling and jack spacing in mind. Once that was decided, it was time to Velcro them down. I bought one roll of guitar-specific Velcro and got to work sticking the pedals in place. For my purposes, rather than plastering the entire shelf or pedal bottoms with Velcro, I created appropriately sized Velcro feet for each pedal. For my Mooger Fugger pedals, I had to remove their rubber feet and then I flipped the bottom plate around so I wouldn't run the risk of pulling the bottom pedal documents off if I ever wanted to de-Velcro them. After measuring, double checking, and testing my pedal placement, which included clamping a couple of rack spacers down on the shelves to aid with alignment, I was ready to wire them up. To power your pedals, be it on a traditional guitar pedal board or in a situation like this, I would recommend the purchase of a dedicated multi-pedal power supply. Beyond reasons of making sure your pedals have the correct level of clean power, etc., in most situations, it's a matter of space and practicality. Almost all guitar effects pedals are powered with wall wart style power supplies. Powering one or two pedals this way might be fine, but the minute you get to more than that, finding correctly spaced outlets on your studio power strips is gonna be more hassle than it's worth. In my situation, I needed to power 10 pedals, and since the largest number in my collection are made by Strymon, I decided to go with the company's Zuma power supply, which offers nine 500 milliamp, nine volt pedal outlets with power cables included. Another benefit of the Zuma is that the system is expandable. For instance, you can add one or more of the company's five outlet Ohi boxes. I also found this setup handy as I still need to use my pedals live with my synth rig and having an Ohi on my live board and the Zuma in the studio is quite handy. With power sorted, I wired up all of the power cables to each pedal and using plastic cable ties and large metal washers run through the vent holes in the server shelves, I was able to accomplish tight, neat, and clean cable runs to the Zuma, which I mounted inside my rack and Velcroed it to the top of one of my synth modules. To power pedal number 10, one of the Moogerfugers, I did use a single wall ward adapter. Here, I also learned the lesson that not all pedals, even if they are 9 volt, are not created equally, or, or I should say they're not wired equally. And to get the Zuma to power my Mooger Fuger pedals, I needed to purchase a pair of True Tone polarity converters to use to flip the polarity of the pin outs. Once this was done, all pedals had power, 
and happy blinky lights. When it came to audio cabling, unlike wiring a traditional pedal board where one can get away with little one to two inch shorty cables, I needed three to six foot cables, two or more for each pedal in a variety of both right angle and straight cable configurations, depending on the location of each pedal's ins and outs. For the pedals with rear located I.O., when possible, I placed those on the back row of each shelf and was able to use straight cables including a few older Hosa and Horizon snakes I had laying around. I of course used the right angle cables for the pedals with ins and outs on their sides, keeping in mind also that the signal flow of guitar pedals runs right to left. The two smaller Strymon pedals, while having rear located ins and outs, needed to live on the front row of the shelf, and I chose to use right angle cables for those as well. Here I should also note that while most guitar pedals are traditionally mono, many companies like Strymon, Earthquaker Devices, TC Electronic, Eventide, Walrus Audio, and others now offer stereo ins and outs, and on a few, such as the Strymon Deco and El Capistan, they have stereo inputs and that requires flipping an internal jumper and the use of a tip ring sleeve or TRS Y cable. Again, as with the power cables, I used cable ties and washers to secure them in place, leaving a touch of play for when I needed to swap out pedals or reposition them on the shelf. Now it was time to plug the pedals into the patch bay. Since guitar pedals are mostly unbalanced devices, I wanted to use a mono tip sleeve or TS unbalanced patch bay. Surprisingly, these are a bit rare, and I luckily still had a now discontinued Behringer PX2000 unbalanced patch bay laying around. Luckily, if you want to use one of these vintage Behringer devices, they can be easily found on eBay and Reverb.com, and they're built really solid, and they're really easy to change the routing and normalizing with top switches, which in my case, I set it to a straight through with zero normaling. I should also note that I do have a quarter inch patch bay that is balanced, and I use that for my synths and some other devices, and it came in handy for making expression pedal and tap pedal connections to some of the pedals like the Strymon. From here, I crawled behind my rack to start attaching the pedals to the bay, and I will offer two bits of advice. One, make sure you keep track of which cable is which, as it applies to ins, outs, and even left, right when applicable. Two, even though you might be using right angled connections on your pedals, make sure that the end that's attaching to the patch bay is a straight jack. You will not comfortably fit multiple sets of right angle jacks into a patch bay unless you're willing to leave a rack space above and below the bay. Also, as you bundle and route your cables together, always check for tension and play with the shelf in and fully extended. Once your connections are made, your cables are dressed and orderly, I would suggest labeling your patch bay. After printing everything on regular paper for test purposes, I then used magnetic printer paper to print labels for the balanced patch bay, but because the face plate of the Behringer is aluminum, I needed to also add some two-sided sticky tape. From here, it's time to add some effects mayhem to your tracks. I'm not going to go deep into reamping or routing external effects in your DAW as those could make their own videos and articles in the future. However, as a quick note, you will need a few reamp specific devices. How many you need depends on how many effects you want to add live to your mixes. And note that you will need at least two separate boxes if you're doing stereo effects. Radial Engineering owns the original reamp brand and offers a large selection of both reamp and radial branded reamping boxes. Other choices include the 500 series Avitas Audio M7, which is a preamp, a reamp, and a line input device that you can use to send signals out and back in with just one box. In my studio, I own and use three Little Labs Red Eye boxes. Two are original and one is the Red Eye 3D, which uses phantom power and can also send signals out and in with one box. To get the pedal signal back into my system, I use the front paddle quarter inch instrument inputs found almost universally on every modern preamp. From there, I'll say good luck with your studio pedal experiments, and I hope you found this video helpful. To find out more, check out my Pedals in the Mix article in the July 2018 issue of Recording Magazine, which also contains nine guitar effects pedal reviews that just might be perfect for your mix. I'll see you soon. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
Also, be sure to stop by our website, recordingmag.com, for the best in all things recording.